The following presentation was recorded at the 2014 Southeast Linux Fest in Charlotte, North Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following diamond sponsors in 2014 for helping make these videos possible. Uh, my name is Dave Stokes. I am a MySQL Community Manager for Oracle. That means I go around evangelizing on what MySQL is doing. I'm also a conduit back to management. So if you ever have a gripe with what we're doing or Oracle in general, give it to me. I pass it along to my bosses. Now, it may not seem like they care, but they take every input that we get from the community and they anguish over it. They won't show it in public, but they do take everything and internalize it. Uh, if you need to get a hold of me, I'm david.stokes at oracle.com. My Twitter handle is at Stoker. Now, if you go through back Twitter traffic, there was a Nicole Kidman movie called Stoker. So if it's red hair and nudity, unfortunately, this time it's not me. Every Oracle presentation has this slide in it. I'm talking about new features. Uh, Oracle normally does not talk about new products until it already has a price and a stock keeping unit and ready to ship open source products. You can't do that. So if I talk about something being blue and you're thinking sky blue and I'm thinking cerulean blue and it ends up kind of a, a navy blue, um, just take what I talk about, say about future products with a grain of salt. Okay, people say, gee, I heard that Oracle bought MySQL what are you guys doing? Well, this is what we have been doing. Uh, we've put out uh, a lot of software. In the past, we overpromised and underdelivered. Now we're trying to overdeliver and underpromise. Uh, so, if you've been wondering what our engineers have been doing for the past four years, uh, that's a list of it. Uh, we're now pushing 250 some odd developers, 40 QA folks, uh, I forget how many support folks, and we are hiring. So, if you know anyone who's looking for a job, uh, last time I checked, there was like 83 or MySQL positions on careers.oracle.com or something like that. Are they all in San Francisco for the most part? No. Uh, the MySQL jobs are usually home-based. So my commute is turned right at the Dachshund, step over the Beagle, and sit down in my chair. Uh, there are some, some San Francisco jobs if you really want to go out there. Uh, we're making money for Oracle. We're turning a profit, which is something very important for the folks at Redwood Shores. We have the number five instructor-led class and the number eight video class in all of Oracle. And Oracle has so many products, it's hard to count up how many classes they actually have. And like I said, we are hiring. Uh, it's actually about 18 months ago we came out with MySQL 5.6. Hopefully you're running 5.5 or 5.6. I wish. You wish. <laughs> Uh, Peter Zaitsev, you'll hear tomorrow from Percona, will tell you if you're having problems, upgrade to 5.6. It fixes a lot, a lot of devils. Uh, we're trying to make the performance better on modern hardware. Uh, the performance is all relative, but our lab guys are seeing over 200% better performance. Uh, if you're kind of marginal on your hardware and you're kind of scraping by and you don't want to go out and buy a new box, try an upgrade. That might get you through. Uh, we've been working on making NODB your storage engine of choice, because most people out there are doing transactions and they want ACID compliance. And I'll talk about some of the things we're doing to make things easier for DBAs or the folks who have to be DBAs for their company. Uh, the optimizer is the core of any database. We'll talk about some of the changes coming up there. Uh, it used to be optimizers were fairly simple things and now they're getting extremely complex. Uh, we've also worked on replication to make life easier. We want to get to the point now where you worry more about the hardware than you do the software. And finally, we will talk a little bit about no SQL. If you bypass the parser and the optimizer and go straight to the data storage, it's nine times faster. Uh, there's a talk after this by Daniel Bartholomew. Uh, he'll talk about handler socket, which is one approach to this. Uh, we took on that approach and changed it a little bit. So if you need to get to data as a key value pair, the NoSQL way, you can do it. But with our approach, you can also approach, hit the same data with SQL at the same time. That's at 
five, six, and five, seven, yeah. Uh, we've also been hearing from a lot of the folks who run Linux distros that you guys are making a lot of changes, we can't keep up. So we decided to come up with our own repositories. Um, they're out there for RHEL, Oracle, Fedora, the Debian world, and most of our other products are out there too. Uh, a lot of the smaller distros, the guy who's maintaining MySQL is also maintaining four other packages, has a wife, kids, a little league, and a job, and trying to keep on top of what we're doing is just murdering them. Also right now, you can download our data milestone release, our development milestone release. As I mentioned earlier, Oracle doesn't talk about upcoming products without making you sign a non-disclosure agreement. Uh, we're different, we'll let you go out and play with our code today. Uh, our main goals were to make InnoDB uh, faster, improve replication. We also added some utilities that are written in Python that do a whole bunch of amazing things like copying databases, checking table integrity, setting up replication between master and slave, and then setting up failover so if the master goes down, the slave takes over. Uh, we've been working on making the thing just tall butt. And lastly, I don't know how many here, how many of you have to support the GB18030 character set? What is it? What is it? <laughs> it's the super duper Chinese character set. Uh, as far as I know, of all the major databases, we're the only one that support it right now. Needless to say, our download rate from China shot through the roof. I don't do, like doing slides with graphs because it's real easy to, to lie with graphs. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about that tomorrow on my big data talk. Uh, but with 5.7, you can get 630,000 queries per second. That's probably past what anyone in here needs. Uh, it's roughly two times faster than 5.6, three times faster than 5.5. Now, if you need more than that, and you use our NoSQL approach, you can get 1,150,000 queries per second, which is a lot of queries. And if that's still not good, on our cluster product, you can get two billion updates a minute. So does that cover everyone in the room here? Make sure. Our work on the optimizer um, it has been rather dramatic. Uh, drop by the booth later and I'll show you Visual Explain. It gives you the query plan of what the... It's uh, awesome. It, yeah, it is. <laughs> it is. It's, it's a butt saver. Um, you can also get the cost information in JSON output, uh, which is some folks are beginning to play with that. Now the cost model is um, First, how many real DBAs do we have in here? Just do DBA stuff. Wow. Uh, how many folks also have DBA stuff, have to do the coding, would probably sweep the parking lot if their boss could put it in their job description? Most of you, okay. In the early days of MySQL, cost was disk IO, most expensive thing in the chain of getting everything going. Well, you'll hear me talk about the Fusion IO cards and a couple others later. Um, there's no delay in a write, it's all atomic. So what is your cost? How do you divide something from zero? So we're changing our cost model. Also, as people add more uh, solid state disks and hybrid disks and all this other stuff, um, it gets kind of messy to try to figure out, okay, what is the real cost of a query? How do I evaluate which parts of the query to do in what order? So we're making that configurable. Um, part of it will be hints, and I have a feeling part of it will be we're adding smarts to go out there and ask the system, what hardware do you have? I know now with 5.7, if you plug in a Fusion I.O. card, it recognizes it and automatically turns off double buffering. Right, right. Which, if you're not writing things twice, it's 50% faster. Uh, NODB is where Oracle is putting the most of their money for storage engines. It's the one rec recommended storage engine that we tell everyone, give it a try, 
If you're still running my ISAM, please convert over. You'll find the speed and the uh, quality of life is a lot better with it. However, in the past, if you needed to change your table, doing it online was a frustrating couple seconds, couple minutes, couple hours, couple days, maybe a week. Uh, what happened is it would take a, the system would take a copy of your table and slowly recarve it to what you wanted. Very slow, very frustrating. Well, we figured out how to do that on the fly for a lot of commands. As I mentioned earlier, Fusion I.O. cards, um, they have atomic writes, so there's no reason to have to write it in two places in case of a crash. It's atomic, one time, don't have to worry about it anymore. We're also doing more things on more intelligent handling of pages and compression. Uh, here's something you should write down for those of you who have bosses who write really bad SQL. You can set this and say, okay, they have a, if they run a query, it's only gonna run 120 seconds or whatever time you wanna give them. Put this in their .my.cnf file in their home directory and whatever query they run, it's not gonna run over that amount of time that you set there. Security. Uh, databases have been kind of a uh, quagmire for, data, for security and we really are trying to step it up. Um, yeah, I, I fat fingered, that should be a 256. Um, yeah, uh, forgive me on that. I'll have to update that on uh, slideshare.net too. Also, password rotation policies. You can now set it up so that passwords rotate and expire. Big caveat there for the application developers. The passwords you use for your application, don't do that on unless you have an application that knows how to set up a new password. Uh, part of this uh, effort that we've been doing is to make things better for the cloud. And in the cloud, if you throw up a MySQL instance right now, there's anonymous accounts, there's a test data set, and there's no root password. Um, not exactly a great situation. So from now on with 5.7, it will assign a root password. It will get rid of the test account. It will get rid of the anonymous accounts. I will tell you under slash root dot my under, mysql underscore root or my underscore password what the, the password is. So you secure shell in and grab it that way and then you can change it. Cool. GIS. Uh, this won me two cases of beer from friends who had to run Postgres because they needed GIS information. And they said, as soon as you get that running in MySQL, we'll beer you. Uh, I don't, didn't have any direct influence, but I'm very happy the two cases of beer. Uh, we went to boot, uh, boost.geometry instead of boot, I'm sorry, and uh, used, used their code and we contribute back to them. So now you have all the lovely GIS stuff for your own uh, equivalents of open maps and all that. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, the Chinese character set. Performance schema was added starting in 5.5, uh, continued 5.6, or information schema was 5.5, performance schema in 5.5, um, came out in 5.6. Uh, in the past, the low level, you couldn't really tell what was going on in a server. Uh, the Oracle DBAs would come through and say, I have all these V dollar variables that tell me whom the hogs are, who's doing what to whom, what queries are doing to my system, and we never had that. So now we have some of those and we're adding more. Uh, there is a performance hit of three to 5% that you can just turn it off if you need that more performance. But if you're trying to figure out what's going on with your system and you want to turn, tune things, <coughs> It gives you a whole lot of information. Uh, if you stop by the, the desk later, I can show you using MySQL Workbench some of that information and how it flows out, and it's uh, amazing. You can reset the counters, run your queries, come back and see exactly what's been going on. We've also came up with something we're calling the Sys Schema. This is kind of like prepackaged views of some of the information for performance schema and information schema. Uh, it's a general task that DBAs do to try to figure out what's going on with their system. Um, 
there's a lot of documentation going to come out in the next couple of months on that. We're trying to figure out what do DBAs need on a regular basis and how to prepackage these queries for you. So we're going to give you the tools you need so that you can figure out what's really going on as your system runs. Okay, replication. Has anyone here ever set up Oracle replication? Oracle or Oracle MySQL? Oracle. Okay. How long did it take you? Long time the first time. Long time the first time. Uh, the other gentleman, how long did it take you? Yeah. Um, the first time I did Oracle replication took a week of typing. Not a whole lot of actually getting things running. It was a week of typing. Uh, MySQL replication uh, with 5.6 and 5.7. It's a 10 minute typing exercise if you're a slow typer. Uh, with global transaction IDs, uh, you don't have to worry about the log file on the slave is over here, the master is over here, tell it to read from this position to that position and get everything all synced. You just say, go over that box, get from transaction ID one and keep going. Uh, we've been working on getting the throughput better. Uh, it used to be it was single threaded. No longer. Yes, it's a, it helps a lot. Um, we've also been working on semi-synchronous replication. In the past, MySQL has been asynchronous only where the master writes a copy of the transaction out to the log and the slave comes along sometime later, grabs that, and applies it to its own copy of the data. We introduced semi-sync with 5.6, and what that means is the master writes it out to the log, and at least one slave has to acknowledge that it has a copy of it before it proceeds. Uh, we've been making uh, a lot of improvements in that, and there's a recent blog post from Morgan Talker that was last week that says it's only uh, three or four percent slower than general replication. So for the security, I recommend it. We've also been adding checksums and other features to make sure the data doesn't get lost or corrupted. That was for, uh, for the, uh, the lossless version or just the regular semi-sync version? Because you did two, right? Like in 5.6 you did semi-sync, but in 5.7 you did a lossless semi-sync, right? Yeah, we're, we're, we're making it so that you have checkpoints and a whole bunch of other stuff to... Because uh, the Japanese guy at Facebook, I forget his name. Yoshinori Motsunobu? Yeah, thank you. <laughs> he was saying that, uh, that the lossless one was actually, if I remember correctly, he said that the lossless one was actually faster for him. For him, yes. Than, uh, than even just not. Yeah, um, for those who didn't hear, uh, one of the Facebook engineers I was saying that the lossless replication was faster than him than the standard asynchronous. Right. Uh, the guys at Facebook can walk on water sometimes. Sure. So um, <laughs> I, I'm not really sure what he was doing at the low level, but uh, Yoshinori really knows his stuff, and if he's happy with it, we're ecstatic. Uh, also, we are going to have in 5.7 dynamic replication filters. So if one of your slaves is filling up, and you want to redirect its traffic to another box, you'll be able to do that on the fly. Really? Yeah. Or suddenly your boss tells you, hey, we work for the IRS and Congress is coming, so <laughs> redirect all the traffic to dev null. No, we won't do that. Multi-source replication. Uh, if you have a big bad box and you want to take all your little shards of data and put them on one box for backup purposes rather than trying to back up 18 different boxes, uh, you can now do that. Uh, originally everything was single threaded and then it was single threaded for schema and now we're trying to make it so that you don't have to worry about being blocked on one table or one schema for replication. Fabric came out about three weeks ago. This is a free tool written in Python that does high availability and it does sharding. It's um, once again free and the idea is that you set up your master and your slave for replication, and you can shard your data with master and slave replicants underneath that. 
and you configure it for automatic failover so if something goes down. Or if you are sharding and you decide you need to cut things into smaller shards, it will cut it down for you. Do you set up like filtering rules or something? Or? Yeah, you, you, you tell it, I want to, instead of breaking everything up A to J and right. all that, you say, okay, I'm going to go A through C and then D through E. And it's very, very slick. If you're not in a situation that's big enough to really need sharding or replication, is this something that could be used to create kind of a shadow server with an automatic failover? Yes, or you could use our MySQL utilities for that. Mm -hmm. uh, what's nice about this, and I've been playing with it at home, is I remember the old days when you had to figure out, okay, who has the virtual IP where? And chase down where it was and reset the networking. This take care, takes care of all that. Uh, the smarts are actually in the connector. So as your program connects in and says, I want to talk to the shard that has the records for uh, Joe Baker, the, it, the connector knows to inquire the fabric controller, OK, I want to talk to Baker, and it gets told to go down to here. Now, this disappears, and you have this set up for high availability. It says, I want to talk to Baker. Oh, it's not there again. Where do I really talk to Baker for? And the connector has all the control of what's going on. I assume if you're going to do some sort of a join, like a multi-join, <coughs> that inadvertently wraps both sides, then you're probably going to have a little bit of issues, I'm guessing, on performance or no? Uh, I'd have to probably see the query. But you mean wrapping between two high availability segments? Yeah, like You'd let's say you somehow join the A through C with the D through in a, you know, with some joins. Yeah. Uh, I'm guessing that you're probably going to only be talking to uh, one box out of this at a time anyway, so I'm, hopefully the server's smart enough to figure out where to pull that from. Sure. Has anyone here played with MySQL cluster? If you need, if you need a MySQL service that doesn't go down, uh, like you're a cell phone company, tracking people as they move from tower to tower, which they all use MySQL cluster, or the US Navy doing carrier flight operations, and you want to make sure that you can land aircraft, refuel them, and take them off while half the ship is on fire and the other half is leaking water, um, that's cluster. It's designed to have no single point of failure, which means you need to buy a whole lot of hardware and network equipment to make sure that it's implemented that way. Uh, it automatically shards on the fly. It's easy to add nodes. You can replicate easily mass active active between data centers. But it's a very um, limited purpose tool. It isn't a general purpose database. You're kind of limited by memory. But if you need 724, 365, uh, this is what we recommend. Does it use the Galera under the covers? No. It's a, a separate product we bought years ago from a telecom company and it's the NDB storage engine. Right. So think of it as, Microsoft, as a MySQL RAID. How does that fit in with the, the fabric? I mean, compared to the speed of the new fabric rollout, I mean, can it provide many of the same benefits? Uh, it can. Um, cluster is kind of like a top fuel drag racer. If you need to go 300 miles an hour, that's your best option. Uh, if you're going down to 7-Eleven to get a gallon of milk, it's probably not what you need. Uh, fabric's kind of a gap between the two. Uh, what we're recommending for folks, um, if they just need a master and slave and zero data loss, uh, standard replication with 5.7, uh, you're going to scale out reads. Uh, Fabric is uh, more for high availability and sharding. Uh, DRBD, anyone here run DRBD? Uh, DRBD works great with NODB, but the only trouble with DRBD is the boxes need to be right next to each other. And if you get into a stoneth loop, uh, everything goes down. And then for those who need everything, uh, is the cluster product. Yes? Oh, I thought the, the only clustering I've done is Percona's cluster. Yeah. And I thought I understood that the clustering, at least 
the Percona cluster. I don't know if it applies here. But I thought that was like good for like medium to large, but for like the really large scenarios that it wasn't as effective. Yeah, um, I'm not an expert on Galera. Uh, there are some other folks at the show that I can point you to. Um, but you're saying at least for the MySQL cluster, like I work for a very, the largest national auto parts distributor. Mm -hmm. So I have a decent amount of data and servers. Yeah. You're saying if I wanted to do something like this, we're sharding right now with just, just sharding. Yeah. You're saying that the MySQL cluster potentially would be something I might be interested in. Uh, potentially, if you need uh, five nines availability, uh, you need sub millisecond or two or three millisecond response time, like a cell phone going between tower. Uh, it's not a general purpose database. I'd be more likely to point you towards fabric and maybe some of your more critical applications like tracking shipments of parts. Uh, if you have your own truck fleet and you have a way of tracking them uh, through a satellite, maybe do that with cluster if you really need to know where they are every second. Is the, are they both open source or are they both paid products? Open source, yeah. By the way, everything I've, I've talked about so far, unless I said it was paid, I mean open, it's open source, it's free. Um, is, that, is that a new thing for cluster? I thought it was PC proprietary only or not? No, the, the source code's out there. Okay, 5.7 is great. It's going to be bigger, faster, stronger, smarter, does all the other stuff. But anytime you bring in something new, you break stuff. Press. <laughs> so uh, we know there's going to be some pain, and we're trying to come out beforehand and say, this is what we're breaking. Beware. Uh, one of the reasons we're saying this is we don't want you caught flat-footed and we're trying to get folks to prepare. And also behaviorists will tell you that if something bad or something potentially bad is going to happen, alert the people as soon as you can. Let them come to terms with it. Uh, this probably won't touch anyone in this room. Uh, if you did um, grouping, on objects that weren't part of your query, uh, the primary key in the query, MySQL used to give kind of random results. Frustrated the hell out of a lot of very serious DBAs. Most people didn't notice. Uh, we're fixing that to make sure that you're grouping only on what you're selecting. Uh, replication. We're going to make durable the default. Well, what does that mean? Well, in the past, the replication log was on a file. The data was in an NODB table. Uh, system crashes, it comes back up. You have incompatibilities between the file because the file's here and NODB's here. So we got the smart idea of putting all of the log files in an NODB table. So as NODB rebuilds itself, it knows where the checkpoints are and rebuilds itself rather efficiently. In 5.7, that's going to be the default. Um, I'm sorry, I have a question. Um, back, back on the slide, if you don't mind. The, uh, the two table entries, is that for, rep that sounds like it's for replication? Yeah. So table will be default over, let's say, file then? Yeah. Do you know, do you know why? Like, because I'm using replication, I'm doing file. Yeah. Well, in the case of a crash, NODB knows how to, how to efficiently rebuild itself. And it doesn't know anything about the log file. And it's until it starts trying to get everything synced back up. And in the past, it was always a, a great mess because you never know when the system did the FCTL on the file. So it's for basically auto repair, kind of. Yeah. Cool. Uh, we're going to deprecate show engine NODB mutex. Uh, we have that information in other places. We're going to get rid of the NODB monitor tables. Uh, anyone here run work, uh, WordPress? Okay, this is going to bite you in the butt. Uh, WordPress is very loosey-goosey. Their idea is that no matter what you do to it, it's never going to cause WordPress to fail. Well, by putting in strict mode, uh, it causes WordPress to fail. So why are we putting in strict mode and pissing off 
all the WordPress users. After all, everyone tells you it's the world's best CMS out there. Well, for years we've had people saying, MySQL throws away data. Uh, I had two discussions on that today, including one earlier. And we just said, well, to tighten things up, let's make strict mode strict. So you can't put in all zeros for a date. You can't try to put in 17 characters in a 16 character field, things like that. So we're more strict, breaks WordPress. Uh, we're getting rid of explain partitions and explain extended. Anyone ever use any of those? Okay. Uh, that will all be part of Visual Explain. Uh, please come by the booth later and let me show you Visual Explain. Uh, I wowed a couple of people earlier today on that. Um, alter Ignore Table. This was something that wasn't in the standard and some of the purists objected. <coughs> query Cache. Uh, in the early days of MySQL, we told you to run a query cache because if you're repeating a query over and over and over again, it didn't make sense to run it through the parser or the optimizer and go out and do it. Just put it in a cache. Well, someone finally figured out, well, if you're running a query over and over and over again, you need to either put it in a caching layer like memcached or bury it someplace in storage in your application. So we're advising people, turn off the query cache, add the memory back into the general pool for the server. And um, this caused a big objection a couple weeks ago. Uh, in the early days, rather than running out null, we did a backslash capital N into things like my, my into dump tables from MySQL dump. Um, we don't know of anyone using it, and we've only got one objection so far, and that was for Monty. <laughs> so you cared deeply. Um, well, he made a case for it, but it was one of those things where the coders were going, it's a kludge. We knew it was a kludge. Yes, sir? How is the backslash n going to work with doing like coalesce and then left after joins? Uh, it shouldn't affect those at all. This is just for, I believe, writing it out serialized. But internally, NOD, the storage engine should handle all that. Uh, federated and merged storage engines. Um, if you're going to do that, we prefer multi source, we recommend multi source replication for federated. Um, we don't know of anyone who's really seriously using federated. Um, if you do, please let me know. I have some engineers who would love to talk to you. That's I, it's not real, is it? Oh, it's real, yeah. Is that a dolphin? That's a baby dolphin, yes. Yeah. Um, the, the other thing, if you ever see one born in the wild, it's a very bloody experience, and the mom gets the baby out of there as soon as it can. So I don't know. The, I just saw this picture and liked it. Okay, so we've been working on making things better, bigger, stronger. And these are our goals going on for MySQL. We're trying to optimize it for the general web and the cloud and embedded and every other use case we can figure. We're going through the architecture. We're trying to make it pluggable. Uh, in the past, you could add storage engines, but it was a pain in the butt. It's not well documented. We're going through and cleaning up that code. Uh, we have several companies we're working with who are making suggestions on how they can get their stuff in there. Uh, if you're really curious about that, let me know. I can give you some more details later. Uh, we're adding a data dictionary to NODB. It doesn't mean much to you right now, but if you're doing cross schema joins, it will make a big performance increase for you in the future. Automagically? Automagically. Mm, I like automagic. Um, we're, was, like I said earlier, we're trying to get to the point where you're worrying more about the hardware than you are actually about the software running on top of it. What can you tell me about the embedded use cases? What do you have in mind? Um, the, the one that I was playing with two weeks ago was an in-dash system for a car. Um, MySQL was monitoring everything you were doing in the car, you know, volume of your radio, fuel consumption, air fuel mixture from the engine, and it was a real, something about the size of a cigarette pack that's buried into your dashboard. And 
The great thing about it is you go to your car dealership, they plug it in there and they can tell you if you're listening to Grateful Dead at 70 miles an hour on Tuesday when you had a misfire. Uh, the only trouble is that same information is available via court order to the guy that you happen to run over while you're listening to the Grateful Dead. Uh, we're trying to do faster connections per second. There was an announcement this past April, Google, Facebook, LinkedIn, and some other folks are throwing a bunch of their patches together and we're incorporating those to make things bigger, faster. Now, very few of us in this room have the problems that those companies do, but it's nice to know that they're contributing code back to the community and we're incorporating what we can when we can. You do if you make the mistake of running a uh, MySQL backed mail server without hashing, you'll, you'll break the connections per second pretty quick on that. Yeah. Uh, was it just a simple mistake or did you do it on purpose or? No, the, the first time I set one up, I didn't know about, you know, Postfix being able to hash it so it wouldn't just keep looking it up in the database, so it just kept looking it up in the database. Ouch. And then somebody told me about it, but, you know. Okay. Um, for the folks who are serious DBAs in here, uh, how often do you, do you use other databases? I use Percona Server and MySQL Command Edition. Okay, but no DB2, no Oracle or anything like that? I've done a lot of work on SQL Server. Okay. Um, yeah. Do you lose a lot? Do you use a lot of um, triggers and other stored procedures to do business logic within the app within the database? Not really. We do a little bit of stored procs, but, uh, but uh, on the SQL Server we do some okay. stored procs there, but no triggers. No triggers. Uh, the reason I'm asking is in some of the database world, a lot of the smarts for your application actually reside in the database which is real frustrating if you don't know that because you add, you put a seven in a column and it ends up being 42. I'm sorry, I do have one or two, I do have a small number of triggers. Okay. Very, very small number. Yeah. Um, especially if you're playing with an Oracle database, you type in five, boom, there's 42. What the hell, I'll update that column, I'll set it back to five, you set to five, you do a select on it and it's back to 42. Um, what's happened is there might be a trigger, might be a stored procedure, there might be multiple triggers in stored procedures. Uh, something that some analyst came up with said, okay, whenever you see this in this column, you're gonna change it to that. Uh, generally, the MySQL and Postgres world have been immune to that. Uh, makes it a lot easier to debug database-based applications. Um, however, triggers are very useful. Uh, I use them in logs where if someone changes the value of something like say a price in your sales catalog and you run a record where and when it changed in another table. You can use a trigger so that as you change the price, it automatically logs it into another table. Or it can do other, other actions on the data. Uh, it's real handy. Now in the past, MySQL had one trigger per action per table. So if you're doing an update, uh, you've got one action to do on an update. Well, now you can stack the triggers. I think we're gonna see a little bit more business logic going into our applications, which for those of you who aren't regular DBAs, it's gonna be a pain in the butt. But it'll also have some benefit hopefully later. Error logging. Uh, if you've ever turned on slow query log, log queries without indexes and a couple other things, you can run yourself out of space rather quickly. We're configuring uh, we're setting things up so that you can configure the level of errors, error logging you get. You can get just errors, you get errors and warnings, you can get the entire list soup to nuts. Uh, you can set it globally on the fly. Uh, if you want to learn more, uh, mysql.com, uh, see us at the booth. Uh, if you can occasionally read planet.mysql.com. That's a blog aggregation site that we run. And it'll keep you apprised to what we're doing, uh, what the other vendors like Percona, Sky are doing, what the folks at Facebook are doing, uh, what's going on in the world. Now, on the bottom, edelivery.oracle.com. This is the uh, place where you can download the enterprise version of MySQL products. Uh, free for 30 days, there's no time bomb in there, so if you run 31 days, your systems won't melt. Uh, the sales guys might be banging down your door, but uh, it's nothing that's gonna be crippling you. If you run into 
something where you can't figure it out and you want to try out Enterprise Monitor or you want to try out the new backup tools that we have, they're down there, try them out free for 30 days. We do offer training. We also just re rebooted our certification program. You might have heard us talking earlier, the certification exam is tough. Also, we have a show coming up. We're now part of Oracle Open World. In the past, we were tacked on. Uh, this will be the cheap ticket to Open World. Uh, has anyone ever been to Open World here? I used to present. You used to present. Well, I'm sorry. I worked for Marketer Technologies. We were an Oracle partner at the yeah. time. Okay. Um, he will tell you that San Francisco with an extra 60,000 bodies for Oracle Open World is an amazing city. The taxi drivers, the restaurant owners, and the waitresses are all exhausted, happy, and rich. Um, the only trouble is San Francisco is very expensive. You can save 500 bucks off the ticket between now and I think it's July 18th. Also, the MySQL ticket is going to be the cheap ticket to get into open world. Uh, if you don't know, Larry on the next to last night rents out an island in San Francisco Bay and brings in a top rock act of two or three years ago and has a major party. If you have questions for me, um, I'm david.stokes at oracle.com, at Stoker on Twitter. Uh, the slides will be out at slideshare.net slash Dave Stokes. Uh, please hit me at the booth. I also have one of our sales engineers who's uh, fairly local to the area. Uh, don't hesitate to ping us on anything. Good. Really, really cool stuff. I'm glad you're happy with it. Okay. Yes, sir. Uh, do you have a totally unofficial estimation of when Final <coughs> 7 might be released for final release? Um, can't give you a solid date. Uh, the engineers are putting all the tinker toys together. Mm -hmm. um, all I've been told is it's sometime the next year or so. Uh, which the way they treat me, it, it, on purpose they keep me in the dark for, for good reasons because I'm a blabbermouth. I might fire up my computer after this and find out that it's already been launched or it might be next Christ, Christmas after this one. I don't know, it's sometime roughly a year or so. Well, how, let's say, if we're on 5.5 now, how painful is the upgrade from 5.5 to 5.6? Uh, did you do the 5.0 to 5.1 upgrade? 5051 was painful, and we apologize. It was real nasty. Uh, 51 to 55 was anticlimactic. 55 to 56 is equally anticlimactic. Mm -hmm. uh, read the upgrade notes because there are a couple of gutches out there, and it's always better before them. Um, you'll probably get about 15, maybe 20 percent better throughput, but it's fairly easy. Just remember to run the upgrade script after you get done. Yeah. Do we need to? I'm oh, sorry. Yeah. Do we need to? Uh, do we need? To, I know standard pro procedure when you're upgrading, especially major versions, isn't to do a binary copy, but rather to do a logical dump and then an import. Is that? Is that correct? Um, read the upgrade notes. I've always been paranoid. I always do dumps and snapshots, and then do my upgrade on the the data is there. And since 5.0, I haven't lost anything. Oh, you're just replacing the binaries. You're doing a backup for safety, and you're just replacing the binaries. Yeah. Now, with 5.5 and 5.6, and soon to be 5.7, there are some changes, most notably in the MySQL table, where we're adding um, things like password aging fields. Right. Uh, that's part of the upgrade script. But, okay. but since the days of 5.0, I haven't lost any data during an upgrade. Yeah, that goes through and updates everything, or it should. It's just that I've always learned if I'm not paranoid and I don't have three copies of it, I get bit in the butt. We recently upgraded uh, some of our systems to 5.5 and 5.6, and the intention in 5.6 default is to not have query tags and like replicating volume in the table, not files. I'm wondering now if there's other things that we might have not, like if we just went from 5.5 to 5.6,
Uh, you might want to revisit turning off the query cache. Uh, the one thing I recommend is check your replication. Yeah. Um, GTIDs in 5.6 are a major time saver. Uh, global transaction IDs, every transaction has a unique ID. Uh, so if your server has already seen that, trans your slave already seen that transaction, ignores it, if it hasn't seen it, it gobbles it up. Also, um, you can set it up so that it smartly replicates. So if you have a row that's 70 columns long and you're only changing one column, you don't need to send all 70 columns. Because we're actually seeing CRC replication errors right now in 5.6, which is why we haven't continued with our other five. And the DBA, I'm not actually seeing they have a running resource, but mm -hmm. it's going around and around because we don't see any reason for it from a network layer, from a web layer, and then that yeah. would take it over to Oracle. It's got some recommendations, but I bet he's still doing the log, the replication log. Yeah. Are you um, doing SQL or, or uh, are you doing statement or row based replication? Check with Tony out at the, the table. He might have some ideas. Yeah, because we're really out of ideas. <laughs> yeah. But the query cache, if you're happy with it and you don't want to get rid of it, you don't have to. It's just we're recommending free up the memory for that. I'd like to just check out the term and check in. Yeah. And if you already have an open support case, um, check with Tony. He might have some ideas. Okay. Yes, sir. Yeah, federated is something we really haven't been actively developing, and it's kind of messy, and it was a kludge back when it was originally put together. Um, some people have been playing with federated X, but we figure a better way to do it was multi-master replication. Or, the, let me go back to the... Well, do me a favor and um, give me your contact information because I know some engineers that would like to talk to you about that. Um, one of the troubles, some of the storage engines like Federated, we only run five or six customers who actually run it. And it's hard to find someone saying, hey, what do you really think? What are you using? How are you using it? Uh, like I said, let me have your contact information. I have some engineers I want to put you in contact with. Okay. You mentioned uh, the, the, uh, the fabric mm -hmm. that the client is, uh, there's changes in the client to handle the fabric. Can you, can you elaborate on that? The, the client uses a connector that has the smarts in it, and those smarts are used to find out what shard you need to talk to. And if that shard goes away, or there's uh, part of your... So the HA logic is also compliant? Uh, the connector basically knows about it, and your application really doesn't have to change. Now, if you're running PHP today, uh, with a PECL extension, you can get some of that for load balancing between, if you're doing split read writes, where it knows... Or Java. Java, yeah, Java you'll, you'll be happy with. Anything else? Um, I'm in a, a totally off the wall question. It's 5.1. Okay. I can't wait to get to 5.6. And I'm probably going to jump straight from 5.1 to 5.6. Hopefully, hopefully it'll be smooth. Um, the replication, I'm getting ready to roll out 80 replication servers and uh, I'm trying to automate. But, uh, and I stumbled across as I've been Googling for how to do this, because I've got some problems where I unfortunately can't do it completely with Puppet. 
I found something in the utilities, the MySQL utilities. Mm -hmm. For like, I didn't get a chance to finish reading up on it, but it was it was a something I would run like say through Workbench or whatever that yeah. for setting up a for provisioning a slate. Yeah, Does you that can work on five one or is it like five six five seven only or. Um, I know five 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 six five seven. It works. I'm not sure about five one. So is it as magical as it sounds? Like, is it really gonna just? Uh, I know between five six boxes, I've been able to have three VMs that were brand new, and point them to a, another box in my my home network and say, suck everything down. Uh, by the way, if the master goes down after you get everything copied and you set up replication, one of you self promote to become the new master. I know that works very slickly, but I don't know if it works with 5.1. Yeah, I was reading it. It sounded really, it sounded yeah. really nice. Uh, if you want a fast answer, uh, the replication form or the utilities form would probably be better on forums.mysql.com. The, um, the folks who, monitor, who are engineers who monitor that board will get you a good answer on how it works with 5.1. The replication ones or what? Or actually the, the utilities. Uh, I know I mentioned in passing, utilities are a bunch of scripts we have written in, in Python that do a whole bunch of neat, wonderful things like copying things over from a master to a new slave. So it's doing the streaming to copy over the data, right? Yeah. Does it allow like throttling in case you know, you've got a heavy server, do you know? Uh, I'm not sure. I've never had to sure. worry about that. But oh, I'm sorry. One other question related to it. It seems like the if I read it correctly, it sounded like the only way to run it was through the Workbench. No, you can run it as a standalone Python program if you're comfortable doing that. Okay, cool. Um, Workbench is all Python, right? So I imagine it's not. Um, I remember running it standalone Python. I had to get the right Python connector. I had an old version of the connector that came with Ubuntu. So I had to download the latest version of that, and it was very smooth command line work from there. Well, one last question for you all before we go. Um, this is the zero to DBA track. Uh, Jeremy and I set this up a couple years ago to try to educate more folks who are interested in being DBAs or have DBA committals. Uh, what other talks that we're not offering this year that you need? Do you want more on replication? Do you want more on tuning? Do you want more on queries? Do you want more on storage engines? What sort of information aren't you getting that you want? System tuning and scaling. Pardon? Scaling. scaling. <laughs> yes. Replication? Okay. Uh, anything else you want to see in 2015? GTID, absolutely perfect. GTID, yeah. <laughs> because the concept is the concept is perfect. It just yeah. Execution. Yeah. Yes, sir. What about authentication options for MySQL? I know you have the CAMLF. Yeah. Uh, the one thing you'll like in 5.7 yeah. is you can store your password in an encrypted file in your home directory. And when you do the connection, you point a flag to that file. And there's no password going down the wire in open text. For I'm more concerned about like, centralized applications and not there. Yeah. Um, Yeah. Yeah. B basically, it's like a dot SSH file in your directory that takes care of all that. Um, we're also changing some of the ways of passing strings as we collect passwords for third-party tools. Um, I can show you where that is in the manual. I'm really not well versed in it, but uh, we are working on that. Um, we're we're trying to make all of the security stronger, uh, just because the world's getting more avaricious and people trying to s snarl in to grab stuff for free. So we're, we're trying to ramp up our security as much as we can without hurting people. And unfortunately, there are folks like the WordPress people who we're going to be hurting with 5.7. All right. Yeah, one thing my company told us we have to do is start switching over to SSL. And I've been doing some homework on it. It sounds like the, the overhead on it, especially in the establishing of the connection. It sounds like it's a, it 
extremely high bid. Any thoughts? Or um, unless you can run a private VPN. Um, and I saw that the private v VPNs help a lot, but there's still overhead even there beyond the initial connection, disconnection, it sounded like. Yeah, uh, anytime you do any sort of security, you're taking a hit somewhere. Uh, what, is, what, is like, what is everybody else doing? I mean, I, I mean, uh, a lot of folks are just paying the, the hit, either going with SSL or VPNs or both. Um, the, the question is, if the data leaks out, sure. um, you know, what's the value of that? Right. So, uh, unfortunately, it's a thing where you have to make your choices and, oh, sure. Sure. and none of them are, are that great. Okay, I can see I got the one minute. Uh, Daniel in the back is having a talk on Handler Socket. Uh, if you want to hear about Yoshinori Matsunobu a little bit more, he'll be gladly do that. Uh, then Colin has a talk later on Maria. And tomorrow I'm talking about query, query tuning. So if you ever wondered why I explain lies to you, I'll explain that to you. And I also have a talk on big data. That is not an Oracle talk, but um, a discussion of why I think big data is a fraud. And if you have any questions, please stop me, uh, hit me at the table, and uh, see you at the party tonight. Thank you very much. Customers rely on your website or application. If it's slow or non-responsive, it infuriates your users and costs you money. Keeping your business-critical systems humming along requires insight into what they're doing. Your system metrics tell stories, stories that can reveal performance bottlenecks, resource limitations, and other problems. But how do you keep an eye on all of your system's performance metrics in real time and record this data for later analysis? Enter Longview, the new way to see what's really going on under the hood. The Longview dashboard lets you visualize the status of all your systems, providing you with a bird's eye view of your entire fleet. You can sort by CPU, memory, swap, processes load, and network usage. Click a specific system to access its individual dashboard, then click and drag to zoom in on choke points and get more detail. Comprehensive network data, including inbound and outbound traffic, is available on the Network tab, and Disk Writes and Free Space on the Disks tab, while the Process Explorer displays usage statistics for individual processes. The System Info tab shows listening services, active connections, and available updates. Adding Longview to a system is easy. Just click the button, copy the one-line installation command, then run the command on your Linux system to complete the process. The agent will begin collecting data and sending it to Longview. Then the graphs start rolling. Use Longview to gain visibility into your servers, so when your website or app heats up, it stays up.